Europe has been at war for more than half a year. After the tension of the 30s, a decade when Europe had lurched from crisis to crisis, the war brought the continent a strange calm. After the initial blitzkrieg, when Poland had fallen to the Nazi army in weeks, after the shock of two previously bitter enemies coming together in the Nazi-Soviet pact, an earthquake that realigned the alliances defining Europe, the continent had slipped into something that seemed neither war nor peace. Titanic battles had not been fought. The recurring nightmare that the horrors of the Western Front might be reborn had not happened. Troops on both sides sat and awaited action. In France, the Maginot Line of fortifications, a line of defenses along the German border in which the French placed such faith, was strengthened yet still further. Might was piled upon might. Destruction from the air had not appeared. The air raid shelters, the evacuation of children, the hurried issuing of gas masks had all seemed for nothing. To the people of Britain, this strange calm was called the phony war. The war was fought, but the action was in remote places. At sea, two great battleships had been lost. A German U-boat had daringly crept into the great northern anchorage at Scapa Flow and torpedoed HMS Royal Oak with the loss of 800 lives. In the far southern Atlantic, the German battleship Graf Spey was cornered in the South American port of Montevideo. Rather than sail to face destruction by a waiting British fleet, the German captain chose to scuttle his ship. At sea, the U-boat war against the commerce of the empire had slowly begun. The great liner Queen Elizabeth had made a secret dash to New York to finish her construction. In the far north, the Soviet Union and Finland had fought a bitter war amidst winter snows. Content that the Nazi-Soviet pact gave him a free hand, Stalin felt free to intimidate and bully the smaller countries on his frontiers. Despite fierce resistance against poorly led communist armies, the Soviets eventually inflicted defeat on the Finns and added Finnish territory to that grabbed from Poland. However, as the winter turned to spring, that illusion of peace was to dissolve before the eyes of the world. German armies swept northwards into Denmark and Norway. The aim was to conquer Norway, to secure Scandinavia on Germany's northern flank. Denmark was just in the way. A British expedition to the aid of Norway was rapidly defeated, the campaign ending in fiasco as the Royal Navy had to evacuate the army, a drama which in coming months would be replayed again and again. The crisis of the Norwegian campaign brought the fall of British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain. In the British Parliament, he was famously told, you have been too long for any good you've been doing. In the name of God, go. The British Parliament turned to Winston Churchill, the only politician not tainted by appeasement of the 30s. Churchill's leadership was to be put to the greatest trial from the very start. On the 13th of May, 1940, on taking office, Prime Minister Winston Churchill's message to his new government, to the Parliament and the people of Britain, mirrored the plight of their country. Powerless to make any move that could threaten the Nazi state, Churchill gave no quick and easy solution. He offered no hint of any possible compromise, accommodation or understanding, no promise of any appeasement. I have nothing to offer but blood, toil, tears and sweat, he said. Churchill had come to power as the British war effort had collapsed into chaos in Norway. If the situation had seemed grave enough, the fortunes of Britain and her continental allies immediately plunged to new depths of despair. In the very hours that Churchill was taking office, in Europe, war was about to burst on the West. A German attack began across the whole of the Western border from the sea to Switzerland. In the North, German armies swept into the Netherlands and Belgium.
in the south. 17 divisions were hurled against the fortresses and the defenders of the French Maginot Line. The territory into which the German armies marched was, for the great part, that which had been fought over a generation before. In 1940, as in 1914, a small, highly professional British army took its place alongside the French. However, the war in 1940 was to be far different to that fought in 1914. It was a war where movement replaced static immobility, where the front line moved tens of miles every day, a war where even the words, the front line, came to have little meaning, where the safe area in the rear could in hours become enemy territory, in seconds become a tortured hell of aerial bombardment. The word that history uses for this type of war is Blitzkrieg. Blitzkrieg was a word new to the world. It's a word born of the 20th century. Its first recorded use was 1939, and since then has passed into nearly every language of the world. Blitz, lightning, Krieg, war. Blitzkrieg was known as the lightning war. To understand how Blitzkrieg came about, as with so many of the events of World War II, is to understand the impact of World War I. In 1940, that this war of incredible mobility was played out upon the same stage as where only 30 years previously, an entire generation died moving backwards and forwards over the same shattered few miles of Earth, only emphasized the shock of the new. Throughout the history of human conflict from the first time a club was swung in anger, the advantage in war has swung between the extremes of offense and defense. Those primitive peoples who first used clubs had the advantage, but were bettered when met by those who had also invented the shield. The cycles of offense versus defense have continued throughout the history of warfare to this present day. In World War I, the perfection of just one weapon, the machine gun, had given the defense a crushing advantage. Two men in protected positions could resist a thousand. The result was stalemate, as neither side could mount a decisive attack. The first tanks had appeared in the later stages of the Great War. Lumbering and clumsy, they had crawled their way across the mud, the trenches, and the barbed wire of no man's land. Their contribution to Allied victory was not clear. Over so many of the leaders of the Second World War hung the shadows and ghosts of 1914. In the Great War, generals on both sides, bereft of ideas, had, in despair, resorted to the logic of attrition. The aim was not to defeat the enemy, simply to destroy, to kill soldiers. It was a strategy expressed as bleeding the enemy white. When the First World War was over, historians and military theorists all over the world sought to draw lessons. Winners always tend to think that the same tactics and weapons that won the last war will win the next. France thought the lessons of the war were that the defense had the upper hand, that the machine gun, the entrenched soldier, had the advantage. They sought to defend France by building a line of defenses all along the border with Germany. This was the Maginot Line, most accurately described as the Western Front, cast and set into concrete and steel a complex of forts with protected underground roads, miniature railway systems, and deep bunkers as barracks. The victorious armies of Britain and France saw the tank and the aircraft as just another weapon to be fitted into existing ways of fighting war. Tanks were attached to cavalry units. Tanks were ordered to support the infantry. The result was that tanks moved at the pace of men marching on foot, at the same speed as horse-drawn transport and artillery. 
their job to knock out machine guns so infantry could make a bayonet charge on foot and cavalry could gallop to attack with sabers drawn. It would be completely wrong to suppose that the British and the French ignored the tank. Tanks, in fact, made up large numbers of both countries' armies. The weakness lay in the minds of the commanders, in the theories and ideas of war. Air forces in Britain and France were seen in the light of futuristic theories of imagined wars that could be won by air power alone, where unstoppable bomber forces would bring devastation to the centers of population and industry. The Air Force officers of Britain and France encouraged these ideas. They meant air forces were independent, free from interference by generals or admirals. Britain and France were the winners of World War I. Germany had suffered national disaster. The terms of the Versailles Peace Treaty had destroyed the once proud German military. The German military mind was open to new ideas, rejecting the old ways of thinking that had failed to bring victory. Nazism, National Socialism, believed itself the politics of the future with an ideology of newness which readily embraced modern theories and ideas. It was in this fertile and receptive environment that the new technologies were realized to create the Blitzkrieg. The idea was to create an armored and mechanized army in which all elements moved at the speed of the fastest, not the slowest, where infantry and artillery were mechanized and could keep up with the tanks, where airborne soldiers and paratroopers could be landed behind enemy lines where the Air Force was not independent, fighting its own private war, but was instead dedicated to the support of the Army, with aircraft designed to attack tactical targets, troop formations and supply lines in support of ground attack. The German Luftwaffe was by no means the ultimate fighting organization that its propagandists claimed. By the end of 1940, its weakness would have been laid bare to the world, but in the early summer, the Luftwaffe stood at the peak of its strength and effectiveness. Under the determined will of the Nazi administration, with active preparation for war in mind, Germany had focused on producing just a few highly effective and advanced aircraft. In Britain and France, the air forces were equipped with an assortment of types, some obsolete, some useless. The Luftwaffe's leadership its officers were of a high standard. In Germany, it was an honor and a mark of competence to transfer from army to air force. In Britain and France, such a move was a way for the incompetent to restart a career. Despite the modernity of the means of war, Blitzkrieg had at its heart classic military theory, ideas which would have been understood by the greatest commanders of the past, Alexander the Great, Genghis Khan, Napoleon. Blitzkrieg was not a strategy of wounding the enemy, of destroying him, but of techniques of hitting at the decisive point of rapid fluid maneuver that could respond to the will of quick thinking generals. Blitzkrieg was a strategy of encirclement and of surprise in which victory would go to the quick and the skill. The German word for armor is Panzer. Germany created specialist Panzer divisions, which with close air support and airborne soldiers were to act as the spearheads for German attacks, penetrating deeply behind enemy lines, outflanking and surrounding the enemy. The German army still had traditional elements, slower divisions of foot and horse that reduced and destroyed the pockets surrounded and cut off by the Panzers. Panzer warfare, Blitzkrieg made real the soldier's nightmare. To be surrounded, to be cut off from home and safety, to have no way out. On May 10th, the forces of Britain and France outnumbered those of Germany. Germany had a total of 2,400 tanks, the French 3,000, and the British 1,000. Yet on that day, Hitler told his generals, gentlemen, you are about to witness the most famous victory in history. In the south lay the Maginot Line, 
fortifications against which the strongest of forces would find it difficult to prevail. This was where the French expected an attack. As a diversion, the Germans threw masses of ordinary non-mechanized and non-armored troops against the line. The Maginot fortifications did not extend across the Belgian frontier. Opposite these areas in northern France stood the best of the French army and the entire British army, guarding against a strike that would seek to bypass and outflank the Maginot line and thrust to the rear towards Paris. This was what Germany had done in 1914, invading neutral Belgium to outflank the French. However, in 1940, the thrust came farther to the north, into Holland and northern Belgium. The French and British moved to meet the invasion. The northern attack was bait, an enticement, and a provocation. It was designed to draw the British and French to the north, into a trap, into destruction. As the Western Allies moved north, silently, quietly, through the dense forest of the Ardennes, came a third German attack. This concentrated the German panzer armies in one massive tank-based formation. The British and the French thought tanks could not work in the wooded country of the Ardennes. They could, and did, creeping slowly through narrow forest lanes, eventually to burst out into open countryside. As this silent menace grew, the first weight of the attack fell upon the Dutch in the north. The Dutch were genuine neutrals, and surprise was complete. A tiny army protected the Netherlands, just 10 divisions strong. It was an army that had not been in the field since 1830. The Dutch Air Force was a mere 125 planes strong and was half destroyed on the ground in the first hours of the assault. The Dutch, historically, had retreated behind barriers of water. German airborne troops simply bypassed these defenses. On May 13th, the Luftwaffe, against no resistance, destroyed the historic center of the city of Rotterdam, and the Dutch surrendered. Still, the British and French advanced toward the north to a decisive battle. Hitler was to say of the campaign, as he received reports of the British and French advancing, it was wonderful the way everything turned out according to plan. When the news came through that the enemy were moving forward along the whole front, I could have wept for joy. They had fallen into the trap they had believed. On May 13th, the British and French armies were deep into Belgium and Holland, and the third German attack burst in their rear, accelerating into open country. Moving at tremendous speed, the Panzer armies swung around to the west, attacking the Channel ports, giving the British and the very best of the French no way out. By May 25th, catastrophe faced the entire British army. The entire British war effort was placed in the gravest peril as the British expeditionary force was nearly surrounded. In the Great War, another British expeditionary force had doggedly defended this small patch of Europe for four years. In 1940, in just weeks, fast-moving panzer armies broke the British line circled around to their rear and threatened to surround the British, denying them a way out by holding the Channel ports. The result would be that the entire army Britain had raised would be lost in mass surrender.
only one door, one way home across the sea, lay slightly open. This was the French port of Dunkirk. The Royal Navy began to organize the army's escape. To close the trap, all the Germans had to do was take Dunkirk. The days between May 26th and June 3rd number among the most important in the history of the world. A point in the timeline of humanity where the actions of a single man, a single mind, a single will has a decisive influence on all that happens ever after. Within the encircled port were both British and French troops. That the British were planning escape was a fact at first hidden from the French. French troops were refused evacuation, and in ugly confrontations, British soldiers opened fire on their allies. The Panzer armies stood outside Dunkirk. They had paused to reorganize, regain their formations and shape, and were ready to make the final assault on the port, their generals ready, eagerly awaiting the order to attack. The order was to come from Adolf Hitler, and that command was crucially delayed for 48 hours. Was it a mistake? Or did Hitler fear he risked his forces? Did he not understand how close his dark ambition lay to fulfillment? Or was it simply loss of nerve? Hitler wanted to completely destroy and humiliate the French, but saw in Britain a potential friend and dreamed of his European empire allied with the British overseas empire, confronting and destroying the forces of Stalin's communism in the East. Of course, there were other factors that stayed the German armies. French armies fought fierce, covering attacks to win time. The Luftwaffe wanted to prove that it could defeat the British without ground forces. The result of Hitler's hesitation was what history has come to know as the miracle of Dunkirk. Dunkirk mobilized the British talent for improvisation, for pulling in unity during crisis, that side of the British personality that is dogged, that refuses to give in, which adversity only inspires to ever stronger resistance. A hastily gathered fleet of small vessels, pleasure ships, small boats used by ordinary people for weekend holidays, crossed the channel and helped rescue the army from the beaches under the guns and bombs of the Third Reich. Abject defeat was turned into a kind of triumph, a kind of victory. Of course, the ships of the Royal Navy were the central element of the effort in the saving of the army, but the lasting image is of civilians, ordinary people, of the man next door, volunteering to climb into tiny craft designed for pleasure on sunny days, crossing a hostile sea to save soldiers from exposed and open beaches under remorseless air attack. A total of 338,000 soldiers escaped over the sea. After the British, 100,000 French were taken. All heavy equipment was lost. Vast stores of artillery, transport, and tanks fell into German hands. Men even threw away helmets and rifles in escape. But helmets, rifles, and tanks can be replaced. Dunkirk turned crushing and humiliating defeat into a version of victory. Dunkirk was demonstration of the British will to endure and in the end prevail. Dunkirk was one of the events of the dark days of the war that gave the British people belief in their future. The possible course of history, had Hitler closed the trap, is stunning to contemplate. Britain would have had to surrender. The war might have ended, and the British Empire become ally to Hitler's tyranny and evil. With the escape of the British, in June, Belgium too capitulated and surrendered to the German occupation. With Nazi armies just 20 miles off sea from British territory, Churchill again repeated a message of defiance. In one of his most famous speeches, he once again took words and forged them into weapons. We shall go on to the end. We shall fight in France. We shall fight on the sea and oceans. We shall fight with growing confidence and growing strength in the air. We shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. 
we shall never surrender. While Churchill issued forth with belligerent defiance, the role of Nazi victory continued. The campaign in Norway came to a close as that country surrendered on June 4th. Hitler's northern flank was secure, and Sweden, although neutral, was insulated from the war, secure from British interference, and falling firmly into the Axis sphere of influence. In France, the forces of Germany had turned south to deal with the French. The remaining soldiers were from the reserve divisions of the French army, poorly equipped, badly trained, and of low morale. It was an army that marched on foot, that Napoleon Bonaparte would have recognized. On June 9th, the French government appealed to American President Roosevelt to act as mediator. He refused, saying he could have no influence on European events. The next day, Italy entered the war, Mussolini's armies invading southern France. Mussolini was simply eager to make sure of a share of the spoils, not to be left out in the victory. In the United States, Mussolini's opportunism caused revulsion. The cynical nature of the attack added to the slowly growing swell of American opposition to the Axis. Italy's first involvement in the fighting could have been taken as a warning that Italy would prove an eventual liability to the Nazi fascist alliance. The French troops opposing the Italians in the south beat off the invasion, and only the later collapse against German forces attacking from the north prevented an embarrassing repulse for the Italians. In France, an impending sense of crisis caused the government to recall to office a hero of the Great War. Marshal Philippe Pétain had been the hero of 1915 and 1916. At the height of the Battle of Verdun, an earlier dark hour of crisis, his simple message of defiance, the famous words, Ils ne passeront pas, they shall not pass, had become a battle cry. This spirit of defiance reflected that offered by Churchill. Tragically, the Pétain of 1940 was not the same man as the hero of 1915. The guilt of many thousands of lives lost, their last dying words, that battle cry, weighed heavy on the old man's shoulders. Pétain immediately suggested a peace with Hitler. On June 10th, the French government fled Paris and declared the city open, hoping by doing so to prevent the capital being fought over and destroyed. Churchill urged them to fight in the streets of Paris, to never surrender but he was ignored. A week later on June 17th, Paris was open for business as usual. Only the tourists enjoying the summer were Germans. At the same time as some Frenchmen served their conquerors drinks, others were still fighting. Ironically, the Maginot Line had proved impregnable, secure until the very last. The Germans forced the French to sign the surrender in the preserved railway car that had seen the German capitulation in 1918. This was just one of a series of vengeful humiliations which Hitler was to inflict upon his enemy. On June 14th, the population of Paris endured the sight of the Wehrmacht marching in triumph down the Champs-Élysées. The surrender terms that Hitler imposed on the French were revenge and retribution for the humiliation of the Treaty of Versailles, a humiliation that the corporal decorated for bravery on the Western Front had felt so keenly. The French army was reduced to 100,000. The cost of the German occupation was to be borne by the French. Hitler famously went sightseeing in the French capital. On the other side of the continent of Europe, yet another opportunist state took its chance. 
the Soviet Union invaded and extinguished the independence of the tiny Baltic states of Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia, annexing them into the USSR. On June 17, Pétain was made premier of a new French government which had made peace with Hitler, with a base in the southern French town of Vichy. The Vichy regime was to become a byword for collaboration and betrayal. On June 18th, another Frenchman, Charles de Gaulle, made a broadcast from London to the French people. He boldly declared that the war was not over and the French must resist. He denied that the Vichy regime had any legitimacy. De Gaulle's story truly proves that there is such a thing as destiny. De Gaulle was a devout Catholic and fierce patriot. Three times wounded in the First World War, he spent much of that conflict as a prisoner of the Germans. His life, until World War II, was spent as an unspectacular career soldier. He wrote books about armored, mechanized war, but his ideas found no acceptance in the French military. In 1940, he was made the commander of a division that was forming, which had some minor successes as the French army crumbled. On June 6th, he was appointed a junior defense minister in the hastily reorganized government. He was a minister for just 10 days. But during that short period, he met and impressed Winston Churchill. When the French government resigned on June 16th, de Gaulle was smuggled into the UK. At Churchill's personal insistence, his famous broadcast was made. De Gaulle became recognized as the head of the Free French and began to mastermind a strategy of striking back at the Axis from wherever possible, most notably the far-flung corners of the French colonial empire. Remote corners of the world declared war against Vichy and the Axis. De Gaulle saw his duty as a religious calling. Events impose this sacred duty on me. I shall not fail to carry it out, he said. De Gaulle would, in the coming years, boldly fight as the leader of a free people, mounting actions independent of his allies. Through strong self-belief, he refused to become subject to Britain and acted as an independent leader. Pétain's government tried de Gaulle for desertion and, in his absence, condemned him to death. The 100,000 free French were just the largest group of defiant exiles that had refused to surrender to the Germans and, by roundabout routes, had escaped from occupied Europe and found their way to Britain to carry on the war. A Czechoslovak brigade, 5,000 strong, existed as part of the British Army. Four squadrons of the RAF flew with Czech markings. The Polish armed forces made up an even more sizable number of anti-Nazi forces. In 1940, there were 14,000 soldiers, numerous naval and merchant ships, and five squadrons in the Polish Air Force. In the coming Battle of Britain, Polish pilots were to be among the most resolute, courageous, and successful destroyers of German attackers. In early July, an engagement was fought which demonstrated to the world that Churchill's defiance was not just words. The French fleet, the fourth largest in the world, lay at anchor, having hardly seen action. The British feared the Vichy government would surrender these ships and place them at the disposal of the Germans. The Royal Navy sent a powerful fleet to lie off the ports in which the French fleet lay, and the French admirals were given hard choices. Put to sea and join the British in a combined fleet, scuttle their ships, or be destroyed. The French Admiralty refused to comply and ordered all ships at sea to move to the ports where the main fleet lay to confront with the British. The Royal Navy intercepted the message and the British ships opened fire. The French ships at anchor were easy targets 
and the bulk of the Vichy Navy was destroyed. Nearly 1,300 French sailors died, creating a legacy of bitterness. Churchill's words were turned into action. Britain really would pay any price to survive. On August 5th, Italian troops invaded British Somalia from their neighboring East African colony. The motivation for war was once more Mussolini's ego and passionate, ravenous hunger for conquest to add to his new Roman Empire. The fighting between European powers and European ideologies was spreading over the surface of the planet to embroil all peoples. Men were to fight and die in all corners of the earth. The fall of France had a wide effect on the conduct of the war, affecting the war of resources, the war of economic and industrial strength. It has been said that all wars have at their root the control of resources, of food, of raw materials, of manufactured products, including weapons themselves. The possession of these resources is as important in bringing victory as much as number and quality of armies, navies, and air forces. The preconditions of the War of Resources was not in Britain's favor. In 1939, Germany was self-sufficient in food and most raw materials. Her supplies of energy were based on coal, oils she had to import, but advanced science and technology meant that coal-based substitutes for oil could be found. In Britain, the position was far different. Britain was a trading nation which looked out to the rest of the world, its merchant fleet the largest. Britain needed to import no less than 55 million tons of goods of all kinds each year to survive. Compared to Germany's self-sufficiency, that merchant fleet had to bring wheat from North America, meat from South America and Australia. If all shipping imports to England were halted, it would take a mere few months to completely starve Britain to death. At the outbreak of war, the huge British Royal Navy had thrown a tight blockade around Germany, closing the narrow gaps of the Channel and the North Sea. German naval strength was trapped, their warships facing a long, tortuous journey before being able to attack British trade. As France fell, this ground, which determined naval strategy, shifted. With the occupation of France, the Germans could use the French Atlantic ports from where 100 years before Napoleon's navy threw down its challenge to the British, another struggle in which Britain struggled for life or death against a continental dictator. German U-boats could now have easy access to the clear, deep blue water of the ocean. As soon as a U-boat left French coastal waters, it entered the shipping lanes that brought oil from Africa and the Middle East, that carried armies to Britain's overseas empire, over which flowed strategic materials, without which the RAF could not fly. Sail a short distance further, and were found the ships bearing food from the Americas. Germany was poorly prepared to take advantage of this. The U-boat numbers initially only slowly grew. Churchill was to say, after the war, that the U-boat war 
was the war that truly terrified him. Not a war of flaring battles and glittering achievements, but a fight of statistics, diagrams, and curves that the public did not understand. A war where inspiring words and spirit could have no effect. With the fall of France, Britain and her empire stood completely alone against Hitler. The only weapon was belligerent defiance. Time and time again, Churchill made words into sharp weapons. Let us brace ourselves to our duties, and so bear ourselves that if the British Empire and its Commonwealth last for a thousand years, men will still say this was their finest hour. If we fail, then the whole world, including the United States, will sink into the abyss of a new dark age, made more sinister and more protracted by the lights of perverted science. Britain could have no strategy other than survival. Churchill's hopes lay in involving America in the conflict. All over the south of England, invasion was awaited. Preparations were made. The famous home guard of those too old and too young for military service was recruited. It gave all a sense of involvement. With the passing of time, the measures of improvised weapons now seems comedic, the stuff of farce. From within the home guard, a highly secret elite of stay-behind saboteurs was given special training to work from secret hideouts. That an army of old men and boys were preparing to defend their homes against the might of the German army, the most modern in the world, using spears and antiques, is a measure of the desperate plight which faced the British people. In the course of your duty, you may have the luck to come in contact with the enemy. If you do, one of your duties is to shoot when you see a sitter and shoot to kill. When, in later years, the Home Guard's German equivalent was called into real action with the aged and children fighting experienced battle-hardened soldiers, there were to be no jokes, no comedy, simply a desperate tragedy. A general atmosphere of fear and tension pervaded the whole of Britain with a feverish climate of paranoia. Both the physical and social structures of Britain were torn apart. Road signs were removed to confuse an invading enemy. Fields were filled with obstacles to hamper glider and airborne forces. Wild experiments were made to set the sea on fire. What became known as parachute fever everywhere created rumors of saboteurs and infiltrators. Wild stories of Germans in British uniform circulated, often caused by misunderstood Polish and Czech soldiers. The classic myth was that of German paratroopers walking the British countryside disguised as nuns. The structure of the country was dismantled in an urgent need for scrap metal. Aluminum pots and pans were collected to make warplanes. Iron railings and fences were gathered to build battleships. These actions were as much a media move as a real search for the materials of war. There was a need to make the whole country feel that something was happening and that each and every one could be involved. The physical signs of desperate paranoia were mirrored by changes to the political and social landscape of Britain. One of the first acts of Churchill's government was to make new laws that effectively abolished traditional British personal freedoms and the right to private property. Now anyone could be told to do any job, and property could be seized by the government and used for the war. The right to strike was abolished. New taxes at 100% were introduced to prevent war profiteers. 
the democracy had paradoxically assumed the garb of the totalitarian dictatorship that it sought to destroy. The fear of subversion meant those thought politically suspect were arrested and detained. Pre-war British fascist leader Oswald Mosley was imprisoned, his followers in the British Union of Fascists interned. As the British people lived lives of febrile panic and paranoia, the fact remained that a few miles away, the German armed forces were preparing to complete the war with the invasion of Britain. It is a fact of history that wars very rarely turn out as political leaders or generals ever imagine. The Blitzkrieg had brought the Nazis stunning success at a speed they had never thought possible. Hitler's view of the world had never encompassed taking on the might of the British Empire. From the earliest days of Hitler's political thought, he had seen his destiny, that of the Nazi movement and that of the German people, as lying in a titanic war in the East against Soviet communism. While Hitler may have sought humiliating revenge on the French, whom he viewed as the prime architects of Germany's interwar humiliation, Against Britain and her empire, he had not planned a war. Now the German command was confronted with the need to plan an invasion of the British Isles. Looked at from the perspective of the longer history of Europe, Germany was now placed in a classic dilemma. A strong continental power used to looking strategically inwards to the east fighting its wars across land frontiers, was faced with the challenge of defeating the preeminent naval power. The invasion of Britain was codenamed Operation Zelova, Operation Sea Lion. Germany was not an historically great naval power, and its attack on Britain was planned more as a river crossing. Landings would be made on the beaches of southern England and the panzers would thrust northward. Today, we think of amphibious warfare as using special landing craft and vessels. This was far from the case in 1940. The fleet to carry the German army across the sea was an improvised armada of river barges and merchant ships. The German Navy was not large enough to engage the British in a powerful fleet-to-fleet -fleet battle. Britain was historically the dominating sea power of the world and its powerful navy would easily subdue and destroy any fleet of clumsy inland craft moving across the channel. For the first time, there was a way to solve the problem of British naval power. All navies in 1940 were vulnerable to air attack. It was aircraft rather than the great guns of other battleships that were to cause the losses of capital ships. The British command of the sea could be countered by the Germans having command of the air. However, to gain command of the air, the Germans had to destroy the RAF. In Churchill's words, the Battle of France is over. The Battle of Britain has begun. Next time on World War II, the complete history, the Battle of Britain rages in the skies over southern England as Hitler's Luftwaffe throws its strength of more than 1,000 bombers against the fighters of the Royal Air Force. Its aim is total air supremacy over the British Isles, to negate British naval power and enable the German army to cross the river and mount the first foreign invasion of the British in nearly 1,000 years. With the army shattered following Dunkirk and the Home Guard preparing to fight with spears, the defense of Britain, the future of civilization, lies in the hands of less than 3,000 young men, the pilots of the RAF, what Churchill called the few. The battle is a war of courage and of technology, as state-of-the-art fighters meet in air-to-air -air combat. The twin legends of the Spitfire and the hurricane are born. The new science of radar, born from the science fiction idea of a death ray, plays a crucial role in the defeat of the Nazi Air Force. 
As Hitler and Luftwaffe Commander Göring play for higher and higher stakes, throwing more and more of Germany's strength against Britain, the tide of battle begins to turn against Britain. In a dramatic switch of policy once more, Hitler makes the wrong choice, and mounting losses force the Luftwaffe to abandon attacks. The Battle of Britain ends, and the Blitz begins. A ruthless assault by night brings death and destruction to the cities as Hitler tries to break the will of the British people. Hitler fails. His efforts only increase the will of the British people to never surrender.